For those of you who are visiting us for the first time here in the sanctuary or via the live stream, we're in our sermon series entitled, A Soul Set Free Letters from a Roman Prisoner. We're reading through the four New Testament books of Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon that the Apostle Paul wrote from jail during a two-year prison sentence. And we're currently preaching through the highly Christ-centered book of Colossians. And one of the themes that we've learned so far is that these young believers in Colossae were under pressure from religious influencers outside of the Christian faith to abandon Jesus and follow false teachings that contradict the gospel. And so Paul responds to these concerns through his pastoral duties by addressing these teachings and clearly communicating to the church that there's only one true God and his name is Jesus Christ. Today's section of scripture begins with a so then, which is based on what Paul has said to the Colossian Christians already. He's reminding the young church of the splendor of the gospel and the freedom that they've received from being in Christ. And that's where we pick up the story this morning in verses six and seven, and it's these two verses that the rest of chapter two is built upon. But before we read the text, let's ask the Holy Spirit to help us understand it. Let's pray, church. Holy Spirit, by the power of your word, reveal to us the love, joy, freedom, and mercy that comes from being in Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, this is Colossians chapter two, verses six to seven. It'll be on the screen in your Bibles or in your bulletin. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Okay, church, so I want to start by making us aware of the fact that Paul uses similar language like he does in verses 6 and 7 in the book of Galatians. And I believe Paul is doubling down because he wants the church to learn and never forget how fundamental it is for every believer to live a life in Christ. Church, whenever we see repetition in the reading of Scripture, it's a reminder for us to pay very close attention. <laughs> Let me say that again. Whenever we see, you pick that up? Okay, sweet, <laughs> yes. We're awake this morning, good. Whenever we see repetition in the reading of Scripture, it's a reminder for us to pay very close attention. So Paul begins in verse 6 by affirming the decisions the Colossian Christians made by putting their faith in Jesus and accepting him as their Lord and Savior. Now this is the first step every believer takes to begin a life in Christ. And then Paul uses four images. And think about how helpful images and visualization, visualizations can be, right? So he wants us here today and the young church of Colossae to receive a better understanding of how important it is to grow in faith and to grow in their relationship with Jesus. So here's what Paul says. First, he says, be rooted in Christ. Think of it this way. Just as plants draw nourishment from the soil through their roots, so we draw life-giving strength from Christ. Second, Paul says, be built up in Christ, right? So I, I know some of my, my seniors are here, right? And, and what happens as a youth pastor is uh, when, the, when the juniors and seniors get ready for college, they they start to fill out pretty big and I start to feel pretty small, okay? And so what I want you to think about here 
is how an athlete trains to build up their body. And so what Paul is saying is that we need to activate our spiritual muscles daily so that we can develop and build upon our faith in Christ. Third, Paul says, be strengthened in the faith. Or another way to look at this is to be firm and fortified in the faith. This means having accountability partners, attending Bible studies, regularly coming to worship, effectively any spiritual discipline that benefits us to live out our faith in Christ. And lastly, Paul says to us, be overflowing with thankfulness. So the imagery I want us to have here is I want you to picture a child. Get a picture of a child in your head. Just put a picture of a child. And I want you to picture them getting ready to pour some juice in a cup. And they're pouring the juice, and you're watching that juice, and you know it's about to go over the top of that cup and spill over onto everything. Don't be that adult that says, stop. Be the adult that says, spill over onto everything, okay? I think that's the thankfulness and gratitude God is inviting us into this morning, saints. To spill over thankfulness onto others, even when we're going through difficult circumstances in our lives. But please, do me a favor. If my son Zachariah or Caleb and coffee hour start spilling everywhere, shut them down for me, will you? Please, thank you so much, appreciate it. Okay, saints, so Paul is reminding the Christians in Colossae about how far they've come. He's encouraging them. He's reminding them. He's infusing them with inspiration. And I think it's so that in verse eight, he could speak truth in love by telling them not to replace their faith in Jesus with any kind of human bondage. But let me stop here for a second and speak to you from my heart because this really matters. When we first surrender our lives to Jesus, we're often immature in many ways but especially in our understanding of who Jesus Christ is. And honestly, church, when I first gave my life to Jesus, I was so immature. And without a doubt, if it weren't for the mature believers God put in my path who were willing to love me enough to tell me the truth when I was acting out in sin, looking for comfort in idols, and not taking the scripture of study seriously, I would never be living in the freedom of Christ I am living in today. I would imagine that all of us have that saint in our life that loved us enough to tell us the truth and it helped shift the trajectory of our lives in small ways and in big ways. And so as a church, we must embrace wholeheartedly the grace of God, but in the same way, we can never shy away from truth that transforms. We all need believers in our inner circle who are willing to love us enough to tell us the truth, just like Paul does here in verse eight in the book of Colossians chapter two. Here's what he says. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceitful philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. I love Paul's shepherdly heart. He cares so much about his people and his love for them is so genuine and that's why he's cautioning them in verse eight. And in essence, what Paul is saying to the church is brothers and sisters in Christ, the motives of these false teachers are not benign. NPC, I wonder if that's a healthy thought we should be discerning as a community today. 
Are the motives of the administrators in our local schools benign? Are the motives of the politicians in our local government benign? Are the motives of the authors whose books are in our local library benign? Church, are the motives of the pastors in our local churches benign? Now, to be clear, church, the Bible commands us to not live our lives in fear. As a matter of fact, we want to be a church that walks by faith even when the pervasiveness of sin is obvious. But the Bible instructs us also to fearlessly face the sin nature of man, just like Paul did in verse 8 by alerting the young influential Colossians about the dangers of false teachers, because he knows such teachings will take them captive. In the original language, the word for captive means to carry off as a slave, and so the idea that the Bible's giving us is carrying someone's soul away from the truth into the slavery of error. And so at the heart of verse eight, Paul's writing against any philosophy of life based on human experiences and ideas that credit humanity, not Christ, with the answer to life's problems. And he masterfully is contrasting the empty philosophy being offered by these false teachers with the spiritual fullness that comes from being in Christ. And guys, Paul is saying there is no comparison. And in verses 9 to 15, he's going to tell us exactly why a life in Christ leads to freedom and life in every way. Let's read verses 19 to 15. For in Christ... All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you've been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Okay, so once again, Paul asserts Christ's divinity by stating that all of God was in Christ's human body. And so Paul is teaching with a fine-tooth comb to the church in Colossae. And our modern-day church That when you know Jesus, you don't need to seek God by means of other religions or cults or unbiblical philosophies as some of the Colossian Christians were doing and many modern day Christians do too. And so what he's getting at is that Christ alone holds the answers to the meaning of life because he is life. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 4, beautifully articulates it this way. In him, him being the person of Jesus, was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And that's why Paul is preaching the Gospel to us this morning. By articulating that in Christ... We have unbroken fellowship with God and freedom from sin. Saints, our debt for sin has been paid in full. Our sins are swept away. We are forgiven by God. We no longer have to carry the boulders of shame on our shoulders. 
We're made new and we're reconciled to God because of the cross of Christ. This good news never gets old and it's transforming lives every single day. We're seeing it in Fairfield County and you're gonna hear about it in Dunlow, West Virginia. More than ever, it's the greatest time to be a youth pastor because students are seeking truth and they recognize with all the noise that's out there, there's gotta be something more in the quietness of in here. We all, all of us here today in the sanctuary and via the live stream should be overflowing with thankfulness because of God's grace that was freely given to us in Christ. Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, offers us incredible insight into how blessed we are to experience the spiritual fullness of God's grace in Christ. Here's what he says. During a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any, belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities. Incarnation? Other religions had different versions of gods appearing in human form. Resurrection? Again, other religions had accounts of return from death. The debate went on for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. For those of you who don't know, C.S. Lewis is sort of a grandfather of the Christian faith, incredible thinker, writer, disciple of Christ. He says, what's the rumpus all about? <laughs> he asked and heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. More talk happened and then finally, Lewis responded, oh, <laughs> this is so easy. It's grace. It's grace. I got an amen at the nine o'clock, just for the record. <laughs> After some discussion, the conferers had to agree the notion of God's love coming to us free of charge no strings attached, seems to be against every human instinct. The Buddhist eightfold path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant and the Muslim code of law, each of these are a way to earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. Like a visitor from a foreign country who notices what the natives overlook, Jesus saw grace everywhere. End quote. Church in Christ, the uniqueness of God's grace abounds. Even for you and for me. Even for the drunk, the abused, the prostitute, the adulterer, the widow, the poor, the rich, the heroin addict, the divorced, the unclean, the murderer, even for you can fill in the blank. Bless you. Okay, church, let's finish. Verses 16 to 23. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, the head is Jesus, from whom the whole body, 
supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Okay, guys, let me, let me summarize this section for you. If you want to go into the, the details, come join us. Men's Bible study on the cutting floor. We'll get into a little bit of it. But here's what's going on. Paul, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is writing very specifically about the freedom that comes from human rules because of living a life in Christ. And here's the reality. Whether we're talking about the ancient city of Colossae or Fairfield County, there's always temptations that can harm our Christian faith. And so Paul, the good pastor that he is, wanted the young Christians in Colossae and us here today to be aware of the things that can harm us. And so here's what he's saying in these verses. He's teaching us to focus on faith in Christ alone rather than outward observances. He's teaching us that there's no reason to be enslaved by rigid legalistic living or severe self-discipline that seeks to please God by extreme measures of self-denial that Christ has already freed them from and us from too. Now, church dedication and discipline are a good part of the Christian life. Paul already commended them because they were disciplined and had regimented lives. But like most things, people can make an idol even out of something healthy like discipline. I appreciate how one Bible teacher interprets this section. He says this, we can take perverse delight in making ourselves do difficult things that win the approval of others, and if you can imagine, even God as well, end quote. At the end of the day, what all these human rules have in common is they lose Christ. But the good news, that if we ever fall short into any of them, we have to remember that there's a way back. Because this type of living church, I would argue, creates a sense of weariness. And most people that live their faith in this way, I would say they're riddled with anxiety. And so if you find yourself in a pattern of legalism or asceticism, there's a solution, and it's to return home. <laughs> return home to Jesus. Because like Judy Garland said while playing Dorothy in the 1939 classic film, The Wizard of Oz, while clicking her heels together, there's, there's, I love that movie, baby. We should watch it. She was so right. Saints, there's truly no place like home. And for believers, for those marked who proclaim to follow Jesus, home is always found in Christ. Thanks be to God.